Hey, what's up my flagship bar crew? Daniel here from Never Enough Tech. Here is where we get personal with the very famous Samsung's 2022 Tippity Top soundbar system, the HWQ990B, currently retailing at $1,700, 200 less than the original $1,900 MSRP. Keep an eye on that. For good reasons, Samsung's Q900 four component soundbar series is widely considered the best money can buy. The Q990B is the third iteration, another evolutionary step of this hexagonal prism form, introduced in 2020 as the Q950T. The 2021 Q950A was a significant improvement over its predecessor for a few reasons, but most obviously, you know, adding two channels to an already loaded 9.1.4 system. The 990B keeps the same eye-popping decadent 16-channel count as the 950A, so why bother with this bar if you can get last year's great bar with the same channel count for hundreds less? Good question. Does the 990B climb higher in a more stealthy way, stall, or tragically stumble down a bit from last year? Let's figure it out. Setup. Just to plug and play if you're seeking the physical remote experience. If you like the benefits of a connected bar, you'll need to download the SmartThings app, then adding the bar is self-guided. You should be fine. So fortunately, I avoided drama on the initial setup. However, keeping a connection with the bar from the app side can be a little iffy. I experienced dropouts, delayed connections, or connections never establishing. All of those were common, and I would say are on par with the field, but, you know, still a little deflating. Usually the app connects reasonably fast, but you know, be prepared for bumps. The components do seem to stay connected to each other fairly well. Um, in my three weeks of experience, I've experienced one occurrence where the rear left speaker lost its connection to the bar. A power cycle resolved the issue. Design and build. Samsung, after two years of upholstering its highest tier sound bar with what must not be named, and not just on the grill, but like on top of the bar, so you can't miss it. Anyway, Samsung finally had a meeting and came to the conclusion that making the ugliest soundbar, while impressive in a way, is not the strategy they want to continue to pursue. And so finally, on the 990B, they removed all of the unsightly rugs from all of the components and embraced a metal and plastic motif, echoing perhaps the 2019 Q90R. The bar, other than losing the shag, has not changed in form. It has retained the Q900 series shape and dimensions at 48.5 inches wide, 2.7 inches tall, so a little taller than optimal from a TV obscuration perspective, but workable, and 5.4 inches deep. The bar shell is punctured metal and wraps around all sides except for the back and bottom. Putting the grill on top is a little outside the soundbar norm, but I think it works. All the mounting screw holes and ports are on the bottom of the bar. The ports are off to the side, which makes fumbling around down there more awkward generally, but um, perhaps provides some relief if you need to make some adjustments while the bar is mounted. None of that sounded family friendly. While the scratchy vibe the bar adopted in 20 and 21 seems like about as bad a decision as you can make, I think it probably came in second behind putting the primary display which has the capacity to show you lots of different kinds of settings and source information on top of the bar. Mercifully, the display found its way back to the front on the very right. Hope is never lost. While the soundbar button movement seems to have shifted quite dramatically towards capacitive, the 990B is sticking with the clickety clackety kind, which I suppose at this point adds a little character. The bar is 17 pounds, which technically qualifies it as a blunt force weapon, so, it's three pounds heavier than the Sonos Arc, six pounds heavier than the LG S95QR, and over twice as heavy as the JBL Bar 9.1. The surrounds casing changed quite a bit. The materials and textures match the bar, so the fabric was casted to St. Helena, I suppose. It has a metal grill on three sides hosting a driver. So the front, um, the side facing away from the center, and top. Samsung bestowed the surrounds with a pinch, nip, sliver of character by applying a bit of a curve on the top. The claim is that the curved top optimizes the placement of the height channel somehow. I think the curve is useful because if your wife puts something decorative on top, it will more likely slide off 
and not block the height channels. Maybe less discussed, um, the sides also have a similar curve, um, definitely unusual. Do these curves actually have a thing to do with sound? I'd wager very little. The surrounds are also placed on something like a pedestal, um, which I think serves mostly as an aesthetic refinement, but I suppose it also improves stability. The power port is on the bottom, along with cord management. Sync buttons and indicator lights are on the back. When you're solid blue, you're cooking. For kit surrounds, these units are on the bulky end. You might find it a little awkward to carry with one hand. They do have a surprising heft and rigidity. Build quality gets a non-hesitant check, a clear step up over last year. The base module woofer cover in 2020 was styled with 15 cent foam. In 2021, I guess like $1 fabric, at least it wasn't foam. And in 2022, Samsung shifted quite noticeably and shaded the driver with this cool looking raised saucer. Samsung is calling it an acoustic lens that is touted as a base refinement mechanism. The unit is quite plain from the front, just a small low contrast Samsung logo. Um, the power port, USB service port and sync buttons are on the back. The bottom has nothing going on except four little rubber feet. As far as these MDF kit subs go, this is amongst the most impressive. The base module is without a doubt a cut above the previous installments. It's probably worth mentioning that this sub is 20% heavier or four pounds heavier than the Q958s, at least hinting that the sub was given a little extra love in this installment. And no, the acoustic lens is only plastic and it is not four pounds. The entire system got significantly improved styling and build quality over the previous installments. That point is really not up for discussion. Next, the driver array. No driver count change from last year, but worth reviewing. There really are an astounding number of mini speakers crammed into this system, 22. All of these noisemakers are grouped to form an 11.1.4 channel system. So we have 11 channels projecting horizontally, often referred to as ear level channels, which are distributed amongst the bar and surrounds. The base module over there is the dot one. The dot four refers to the four upward firing channels, also distributed amongst the bar and surrounds. Okay, let's zoom in on the 7.0.2 channel bar as it's quite the thing. Per usual, the most intricate channels are the left, center, and right, with each of these channels being endowed with two woofers and a tweeter, which really does give the front of the bar the potential to deliver an admirably detailed sound. Moving around the bar horizontally, on the first angle, you will find the left and right surround channels. The bar's angling here is intended to simulate frontish side speakers by bouncing the sound off your side walls. Making it seem as though sound is originating from invisible speakers in the wall, not the sound bar. Each of these two surround channels are given a single woofer. While surround left and right channels are not uncommon on flagship bars, the Sonos Arc and the LG S95QR come to mind. The Q990B does distinguish itself with wide front left and right channels that are designed to fill in the gap between the three front channels and the surround channels. As with the two front surround channels, both the left and right wide angles are a single woofer. Moving to the top of the bar, you have two of your four upward firing channels meant to simulate front ceiling speakers. All right, let's talk surrounds. Each surround module is a 2.0.1 speaker. One of the two ear level channels on each of the surrounds acts as a straight up rear channel meant to create an auditory world behind you. The driver on the adjacent side, facing away from the listener, acts as a rear surround channel meant to provide extra auditory detail on your side, but biased more towards the rear. The upward firing drivers attempt to become your rear ceiling speakers, which would be your left and right rear height channels. The remaining channel is the sub over there, a very important channel in making this system a true force of nature. As mentioned, there is this acoustic lens that is intended to smooth unhelpful amplitude peaks and generally refine the delivery. Sound adjustments. Samsung really does do some serious tryharding in this area. First line of sound grooming, you have four sound modes. So the first, standard, place audio as true, minimum sound fondling. If you play a 2.1 song, you get the left, right, and bass channel making noise. All the other channels, including the center, sits on the bench. Next, you have surround mode, which converts all content to 11.1.4. Third, game mode, which is similar to surround, but does more signal processing to make the soundstage seem wider. 
Adaptive also converts everything to 11.1.4, but continuously evaluates content with on-bar mics to help maintain something like an optimal EQ throughout the span of the content. I typically leave the bar on this mode. You have a room calibration feature, SpaceFit, that uses the same two new microphones inside the bar to inform the system how to best interact with your unique room shape and object placement. From what I've read, it recalibrates maybe up to once a day to account for possible changes in the room. It can be easily toggled on and off. SpaceFit on the Q990B, unlike with the Q950A, does not rely on a connection with a new Samsung TV. So it works for everybody. The room calibration game doesn't stop with SpaceFit. You also have Auto EQ, which is a carryover feature, but it's still nice to point out. It uses microphones in the subwoofer to help smooth the sound help keeps the low tones nimble and concise. This bar does introduce SpaceFit Plus that is compatible with 2021 and 2022 Samsung Q70 series and higher. SpaceFit Sound Plus is something like a combination of SpaceFit Sound coupled with Auto EQ, but with some added benefits. Your bass sound assessment will be a little more refined and tuned more regularly, where Auto EQ only tunes when the user asks for it. There is also, so I'm told, better synchronization with video. Not sure exactly what that means. Anyway, we got some new room tuning goodies bestowed on the 990B for both owners with really new Samsung TVs and, don't know how else to say it, losers. Q-Symphony. Up to now, this feature has allowed you to leverage speakers on the TV to increase your pathetic 16 channel soundbar count to I think 18, which is a little insane. But with the B, along with a 22 model year higher end Q series TV, you can jack your system channel count up to 22 discrete channels, which is totally nuts. Well, until next year, when we'll generally agree that 22 is merely pretty good. Okay, still going, we have Active Voice Amplifier, or AVA. Um, this feature uses microphones to determine if peaks in sound might limit dialogue intelligibility. In response, dialogue is temporarily augmented. Not all EQ controls are prepackaged into black box sound modes. You also have manual EQ controls, so if you prefer to keep this bar on the standard mode, you have seven EQ bands. As standard is aimed at music playback, it has observable suggested EQ settings for pop, jazz, and classical. If you like to hang out in a more advanced sound mode, you are limited to just treble and bass manual EQ adjustments. All right, you also have channel-ish level control, so all channels that have a left and right component are adjusted as a pair. Center left and right are adjusted as a group. So no center specific channel manual adjustment, which seems odd. Um, each of these levers have 13 levels of adjustment from negative six to six. The base module has 19 ranging from negative 12 to six, which suggests some lame customer complained about too much bass. Not a group. Am I done? No. Um, up to now, I have talked about the most shiny sound enhancers using microphones in real time and fancy algorithms. These next adjustments, I'd say, are harder to miss if surgical nips and tucks aren't getting it done. If you're seeking to very obviously and quickly boost the bass level, you can toggle bass boost on for a noticeably more low ND kind of experience without apology. With dialogue enhancement, you get a very noticeable increase in volume and dialogue, though to the detriment to the sound overall. But anyway, it's there for you if active voice amplifier is too cute. And last, night mode. It limits the bar, but mostly bass volume while keeping voice at an audible level. It dramatically cheapens the sound. Turn it off when you don't need it. All in all, if you are so inclined, you really can craft the right sound for you. Codec support. Good news, pretty much everything, or at least all your fundamentals. So multi-channel LPCM, along with the Dolby and DTS suite. Dolby Atmos and DTSX, 3D object-oriented audio are definitely included. Unless you have something kind of exotic like IMAX enhanced audio, this bar can support it. Wireless connectivity. Okay, I've been burying the lead up until now, as this feature seems to be a top-line highlight in Samsung's marketing material. So yes, if the 990B is paired with a select model year 22 Q-series TVs, you have the option for Dolby Atmos and DTSX over Wi-Fi. I am of the people and don't have a model year 22 TV, so I can't test it. So here's my hot take. If you're investing in this bar, you would want a hardwired connection between the TV and bar for audio stability. 
And I'd imagine you don't want to give up the option to pass video to the TV via the bar. If hiding wires between the TV and soundbar is mission 1A, this is a nice option for you. But you know, soldier up. Root the wire through the wall or mount the bar under the TV so it's easier to hide wires. Don't underserve this bar. Unless you want to. I'm not your mom. Moving on, you get AirPlay 2 like last year, which gets you into the multi-room door with other AirPlay 2 enabled audio devices. But still no Chromecast, which is still kind of surprising because only Apple devices can host an AirPlay session and Samsung doesn't sell Apple devices. Only Apple does. Spotify Connect is supported, which is nice if you ain't got no AirPlay, but you got Spotify. As a failsafe, you do have Bluetooth with SBC. So how do I put this nicely? It's better than AAC in terms of bitrate. As with the two previous versions, you still have the tap to pair option, which seems like a decent option to incur minor damage on the phone and bar at the same time. For voice assistance, you have Alexa with a built-in microphone. Alexa. Yeah, the microphone is pretty good. It'll catch your Alexa request without straining. If you happen to be a sometimes Alexa kind of person, you can mute the mic with this mic mute button on the bar. So other than wireless Dolby Atmos and DTSX, there are no major changes on the connectivity front compared to the Q950A. Ports, all business go hobby somewhere else. So you do have the totally expected HDMI eARC, that's the HDMI port that connects to the TV, and two HDMI inputs. So with eARC, you should have no issues getting those high bitrate, lossless audio signals to the bar from an eARC enabled TV. If by chance you do not have an eARC TV, or you just like plugging your source components into the bar for logistical reasons, you can get your unfettered lossless highest quality audio from your console, Apple TV, Blu-ray player, straight to the bar using the HDMI inputs, and the video will be passed right on through to the TV. Keep in mind that the HDMI inputs support only up to 4K 60 Hertz, where your TV may support 4K 120 Hertz. So keep that in mind when deciding when to plug into the bar and the TV. Samsung did include optical, which is not another input, but a sorry eARC alternative. Particularly in the home theater space, this optical is very limited in what kind of audio it can pass, maxing out at stereo PCM and lossy digital 5.1 formats. Optical is rightfully ostracized by being casted to a remote island over there. If you stare long enough, you will also see a USB port straight up the bottom. This is Samsung's subtle way of telling you this is a boring service USB port. So go take your sick jam stick to an LG bar or whatever. Display. It's a little scrolly display that does the normal stuff. Volume, input, source material, Alexa recognition, very middle of the road and normal, which is a huge step up. Controls, yep, TV remote, bar remote, app, and bar controls. Yes, most of your bar controlling will probably be done with the TV remote adjusting volume. If by chance you also have a Samsung TV, you can adjust sound modes, inputs, and other optional enhancements from the settings menu. The bar remote does take on the global Samsung form, so flat and thin, moving away from the curved ergo feel of the previous generations. Quite frankly, it does have a somewhat cheap feel, in particular the volume and woofer rockers that have sharp, unrefined edges. The TV remote's edges are smooth. Um, it's got to be the worst way to save two cents. You have your D-pad with play pause. Um, source and sound modes can be carousel through with repeated presses. Other sound settings require some dedication and patience with D-pad interactions assisted by the scrolly display. The bar buttons include a multifunction button um, for selecting inputs, so waking the bar, evoking Alexa. You'll find volume up and down and a mic mute button to put Alexa in timeout. Um, as this bar can get very loud, Samsung, please, in the next version, put a play pause or a big red stop button directly on the bar as the remotes are probably hiding as well as the phone, and it takes too long to log on to smart things on the phone anyway. One day this will all be yours.
Jesus, on the other hand, seem to thrive there. These outsiders, the Harkonnens, came long before I was born. But... Sound quality. Cheesy, but mm, appropriate. I mean, 22 drivers and 16 discrete channels, you're getting hit from an unmatched number of angles. Extremely immersive, thrilling, physical, crafted, nothing oafish kind of sound. Um, one might take the reasonably cynical stance that a trillion channels on a soundbar is merely a number to inflate to attract buyers. Um, it's definitely that, but man, 16 channels just lets the bar separate sound and present detail in a way that more typical 7 dot and 5 dot soundbar systems just can't keep up with. With the 990B, you're kind of given this acoustic magnifying glass to examine how complex the sound layering is on some of these more action-packed cinematic tracks, whether it be that subtle background unintelligible dialogue, wind, stream trickles, twigs breaking, dirt crunching, wings flapping, or rattles. And while any bar can heat up their tweeters to accentuate those crunchy sound details, there is a tendency for the rest of the sound to become cheapened. The 990B doesn't sound like it has to compromise. With the core of the sound being supported with plenty of mid-range woofers, there is a dense quality cake supporting any icing Samsung may want to spread. What's more, this bar can sustain its more delicate qualities while being, at times, a physical beast. It can do some flashbang type moments while not devolving into an unbalanced, sludgy mess. Even though Samsung is an impersonal megacorp, they do find a way to interject some artistry, maybe even a little character into the sound that is quite pleasing, maybe informed to some extent from the Harman acquisition. The Atmos performance is impressive, as you might expect. This bar just saturates the room with sound and is able to play in that 3D object world in a manner that is categorically different than traditional surround sound. Nonetheless, I tend to think that making the bar sound really good is probably more important to Samsung than delivering the tippity peak of sound bar system Atmos realism. That probably, with some cringe, belongs to Nakamichi with its two sets of surround speakers. Or perhaps the Sony HGA7000 with the submodule and enhanced rear speakers with all that crazy amount of signal processing. So no, I don't think that this soundbar breaks the soundbar Atmos barrier. Um, it does the suspended in space, rain, gunshots, helicopters, explosions really well, but very often you are tying sounds to a speaker. The Atmos is not 100% magic 100% of the time. Music, it's a competent music delivery system. Instruments were presented with a delightful level of texture, the vocals, dynamic and rich. If you're one to try out spatial music, typically Atmos music, this is the kind of kit that should motivate you to buy whatever accessory you need to get that content on this bar. Your very classy 2.1 system just cannot compete on these formats. I've reached an age that basically never allows me to play loud, saturating music in social contexts, largely limited to the few moments a week I'm alone in the house. If I were much cooler and much younger, much less married, and my friends followed suit, this system, at least in my imagination, the base module performance. Um, I think the days of saying Samsung mailed it in on the base module might be over, at least for the flagship. The base moment that has really stuck with me, and I want to say won me over, was during a scene in Rogue One, um, rewatching with my kid, which makes it more fun. Um, and it's like the only redeeming movie of the new era, right? 
Anyway, um, it was a scene where an X-Wing blew up a baddie in the distance and the system made this kind of underwhelming, distant kind of noise. But then the ship flies right towards you and past you. Um, the base did an astounding job of ramping up the physical level and then on a dime, letting it go. It was really powerful, nimble, contoured, and clever in its use of the force. It lets you know from time to time that it is perfectly capable of that chest implosion effect. On the main, the base unit does a great job of filling the low end appropriately. In other systems, I do find myself manually adjusting the base level more frequently, particularly for music, in particular if switching between genres or decades. Talking just sound, I really don't think you're gonna find a, let's say, obviously better sound bar system sound. Um, and no, not the Ambio, sorry. What is certain is that there are a whole lot of inferior options. Wrap up, the Q990B is a top tier soundbar system that is unquestionably better than the Q950A and T. The story is largely one of overdue refinements, not staff stuffing. Um, I geek over the details, so the attention to them in this version makes me want to say the Q990B was a bigger leap than the Q950A. Thanks for taking the journey with me. Gonna wrap this up, catch you on the next one.